I am Andres Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom, the meeting of the sociology study group, which I lead with Aslam Kakar, um, who is defending his PhD uh, early next year in global affairs, is a sociologist and our expert in, in such things. And so today he will... Um, uh, give us a presentation of one of his favorite authors uh, of the study of man. Uh, how do I say his name? Michael. Uh, so you know, I used to uh, <laughs> pronounce it as Poliani, but yesterday I was like, oh, it's not Poliani. It's Polony. I think it's Polony. 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 Very good. So <laughs> I'm glad that you clarified that for me. Um, so, um, Aslam will give a presentation about 25 minutes on the first uh, uh, section of three uh, in the study of men. Then we will have a free-flowing discussion, and then I will corral it because we want to know uh, how we want to focus our efforts uh, in this uh, sociology study group. Aslam, please. Thank you so much, uh, Andreas, and our friends. Um... Good to see you guys again. Uh, so this is, uh, as you can um, see, uh, is is part of this series of uh, previous uh, discussions we have had. Um, I'm obsessed with the question of how do we know that we know, you know, and probably it's because of this obsession that I came across this book uh at this very good bookstore um probably um kirby knows it uh, uh this labyrinth on the south street or maybe it's new it's yeah by <laughs> anyway so so i came across this short book and i was fascinated by the title that the study of man although it should be the study of human beings because um my my girlfriend will kill me if i said the study of man and continue to you know uh, said man 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 and <laughs> i'm already paying reparations for for uh, patriarchy <laughs> so anyway so the study of uh, uh human um beings um and so i uh, bought the book and of course uh, there are three uh, lectures it's a series of lectures one is understanding ourselves the other is the second is the um calling of man and the third is understanding um history um, I mean, we quickly look at, um, yeah, the calling of man and, and understanding history. I read this a couple of months ago, and uh, for this lecture, I started rereading the first lecture, and I thought it's very dense and deep. Um, and I think is, Andres, um, you and Admonus, uh, your father, and maybe other friends, if you read, I find his reasoning very circuitous, so he goes back and forth uh you know you think he makes um the things clear in the in the first few pages but then a couple of pages later he questions his, his earlier proposition so it's a very interesting way of going back and forth so so the the main um uh point that um you can uh, see in in the lecture is in the very first paragraph. I'll be reading a bit also from um, the book, uh, some of the excerpts, which are, I think, very powerful. So um, he says, man's capacity to think is his most outstanding attribute. Um, whoever speaks of man will therefore have to speak at some point of human knowledge. This is a troublesome prospect. And he explains why, for the task seems to be without an end. As soon as we had completed one such study, our subject matter would have been extended by this very achievement. Uh, we should now have to study that we had just completed, since it too would be a work of man. And so we should have to go, go reflecting ever again on our last reflections in an endless and futile endeavor to comprise completely the works of man. So um, this, I, I think, also links to um, uh, Freire's idea of the unfinishedness of understanding. Um, 
from at least from from this um, paragraph. Um, and so then he goes on and says, man must try forever to discover knowledge that will stand up by itself objectively. But the moment he reflects on his own knowledge, he catches himself red handed in the act of upholding his knowledge. He finds himself asserting it to be true, and this asserting and believing is an action which makes an addition to the world on which his knowledge bears. So every time we acquire knowledge, he says, we enlarge the world, the world of man, by something that is not yet incorporated in the object of the knowledge we, we hold. And in this sense, a comprehensive knowledge of man must appear impossible. And he terms this as a logical oddity. I mean, normally we would think that if we work on a, any phenomenon in the world and if we make sense of it, that would mean that we know that thing um, or partly know it. But he says that because it doesn't stop there, so it, it and it continues and and. And where is the end? So it's it seems like an endless effort of of um, um, going about uh, understanding the thing, and then understanding what we understand of the thing. So in this, he calls logical oddity. So this is the, he terms it as logical oddity, and then he argues that it is this logical oddity is is significant for the development of his theory of knowledge. And then he says that there is a solution to the logical oddity. And I think that is the main uh, point of thesis um, or central idea of the lecture. So the solution he, he thinks is in the distinction between two, between two kinds of knowledge. One is explicit knowledge and the other is tacit knowledge or you can also you also calls it articulate knowledge and inarticulate knowledge um and as you move through um the lecture um the pages uh, you know you you will find different names for it so formulated knowledge unformulated knowledge preverbal knowledge and verbal knowledge, or I probably can call it post-verbal knowledge. And then the, 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 the tacit knowledge is what he calls the acritical knowledge. And the explicit knowledge he calls critical knowledge because uh, it affords, meaning the explicit, the critical knowledge is formulated, it is articulate, and it gives us the opportunity to reflect on it, to correct it. And so it's, there is the critical reflection bit that um, is available to us uh, in the articulate knowledge, but not in the inarticulate knowledge. So um, he says that if we call the first kind explicit knowledge and the second tacit knowledge, we may say that we always know tacitly that we are holding our explicit knowledge to be true. If therefore we are satisfied to hold a part of our knowledge tacitly, the vain pursuit of reflecting ever again on our own reflections no longer, no longer arises. Now, what does this mean? This passage, I as I played around with it, um, it, it thought about it, 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 it delves into the relationship between explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge, suggesting that there is a tacit, tacit awareness that accompanies our possession of explicit knowledge, right? Um, now, he, then, then he, the, the, the other important point that he makes is that Tacit knowledge may appear to lack the essential quality of knowledge as it appears to be a doing of our own, lacking the public objective character of explicit knowledge. 
which I think we can all relate to, right? We have all these ideas um, about things, about the world, about, I mean, all kinds of occurrences uh, that are going on in, in the world. But I think we know, we are aware, even, even if we don't think we are aware that, that if I want to share these, I have to be more articulate about right like let's say if you want to share an opinion on the israeli israel hamas war right one has to there are like deep down ideas that you might have that have come from your experiences or your friendships with people from either of the two cultures or religions or places but then there is the making it public objective like giving it an objective sort of shape um i think that if if um, I'm able to you know put this in words, makes this distinction very clear, right? The taste it and and the I mean and this applies to, and the explicit and this applies to um, you know um, humanities um, and the sciences. Although I'll try to uh, stay away from the sciences because I'm not really a scientist. Um, I mean, I have a basic understanding, of course, but um, but yeah. So that is uh, what he says. So so because of this, then he says that um, that that this objection that tacit knowledge doesn't have the quality of explicit knowledge, um, it it cannot be lightly overruled, right? Um, you know, I think I. Uh, before reading this book, I, uh, based on my experience, probably reading and interactions, teaching, just by being in the world, I um, have made this distinction. I, I have always said, not made this distinction, that, and made a distinction too, sorry, yeah. So I've always said that we're all thinkers, like all human beings think, right? Um, and And because we we are alive because we think about life and death and where we come from. And I think that makes us, you know, um, thinkers. But then, um, but then there is thinkers in the most, so that's, as I think the, I mean it at the um, pre-verbal uh, sense um, or, you know, what um, uh, Pol Polanyi also, or Michael Polanyi calls it uh, the lowest, levels of uh, knowing that we are aware in the most basic sense of these questions but then um but can this basic sense be qualified does it qualify as like think you know calling someone a thinker an intellectual a philosopher in like in the most formal sense right then we make a distinction like so i'm aware of this distinction that we are all thinkers but then some of us or some human beings pursue these questions in the most explicit disciplined manner and spend their lives on on these things uh, so so he says that that i think and this is this is fascinating and i'll have a question at the end i which i think he doesn't seem to answer um, along with some other reflections uh, he says that this is this objection that Tacit knowledge is not really knowledge, cannot be overruled, but he says that it is mistaken. And now he, here is this twist. So first he says that, I think, uh, again, like putting these very complex, deep ideas into 20 minutes is, he first, in, in the book, he says that the explicit knowledge is superior because man has language at his disposal or human beings have language and words that they can use right and that makes human beings superior to uh animals right and if he, he says that if you take language out i mean uh there is not much difference between us running a maze and a, and a rat running a maze we we will probably be doing the same thing our behavior our instincts or right um but language makes all the difference because you can create a map or you a map is created for you and then 
even if the map, map is mistaken, you can correct the map. So the again, the re critical reflection, which animals don't have, right? Um, so he says that first, the, the first argument that he makes is that because of our language, we are superior and explicit knowledge is superior. But then he says, is that really the case? Then he questions, it's a twist like in the tale, right? Then it's like, but what about tacit knowledge? Does it have any value? Does it, right? And the objection he says, it's, yeah, the objection seems to be right, but seems cannot be overruled, but it is also mistaken. And why does he say that the objection that tacit knowledge doesn't have the quality of explicit knowledge is mistaken and here he says, he contends, and I quote, I deny that any participation of the knower in the shaping of knowledge must invalidate knowledge. So this is the interesting part. He says, I deny that any participation of the knower or the person in the shaping of knowledge must invalidate knowledge, though I admit it impairs its objectivity. So here he makes the distinction between invalidation and impairment, right? Probably, Krista, you this you might find this interesting because there is also the we were talking about the conscious and the unconscious, right? So so he's like, it doesn't invalidate, it might impair the understanding, but it doesn't invalidate. So his thesis here um, on, on this point that tacit knowledge does have a value is that tacit knowledge is in fact the dominant principle of all knowledge and that its rejection would therefore automatically involve the rejection of any knowledge whatever. So that's a fascinating, uh, I think, twist in, in the argument. Right. As I said, first, he says it's explicit knowledge is superior, but then he says, no, it's tacit knowledge is the dominant principle of all knowledge and that its rejection would therefore automatically involve the rejection of all, any knowledge. Right. Then he goes on and he categorizes three levels of or zones of knowing. One is the lowest levels of knowing or zone of knowing. Then there is the loftiest achievements of human intelligence. The third is the intermediate zone. And I, he, I think, argues that it is in the intermediate zone where the tacit knowledge has most of its applicability. <clears throat> now, what is the lowest of primitive forms of human knowing? These are forms of intelligence which man shares with animals, the kind of intelligence that is situated behind the barrier of language. I am, I, I am... I'm just a fan of like good language. So uh, I, I wish I could just drink this. <laughs> I don't know if there is a way to do that, but this is like, so the kind of intelligence that is situated behind the barrier of language, right? That is what he calls lowest or primitive forms of human knowing. Man's, he says man's or human beings towering superiority over animals is because of his gift of speech. As I, um, talked about a little while ago. And then he contends that human babies until the age of 18 months or so are mentally not much superior to chimpanzees of the same age. I mean, I don't know, this was book was written quite a long time ago. If what, what new research, 1958, wow, I think. So I don't know what new research uh, says, but this is uh, the claim that he makes. Speech makes the difference, he says. Even adult men in the absence of linguistic clues goes about go about life in much the same ways as animals do. He gives the example of rat running a maze in much the same way as man would, except that the letter would have notes or map in possession made for him or made by himself or herself, right? Then he says that one could get it wrong even with a map. Uh, the map could be wrong, as as I earlier indicated, but there is. But here is the difference that is significant. He contends the peculiar risk that we take in relying on any explicitly formulated knowledge is matched by a peculiar opportunity offered by explicit knowledge for reflecting on it critically, which I think we talked about. So I think the advantage of explicit knowledge is that it gives us the opportunity to reflect on it correct it, amend it, right? Um, 
then um and then he says while this articulate verbal knowledge provides us the opportunity for critical reflection nothing quite like this can take place on a pre-articulated level right so I mean, I, I, one can even question this, but this is, um, you know, probably, I mean, we do think about, right? It's not that if you have ideas in your mind without, like, having them in front of you, uh, you know, it's like when you go to therapist, they tell you to write down your thoughts and so you know better what is going on and who you are really. So I guess that's an interesting example of like even uh, to that that helps us in making this distinction, right? Um, and I and I've done it myself. Like you kind of know where you are and what is going on, but when you don't write those things down, you kind of you can still reflect on it, but it doesn't really help because you st you feel lost in your head. So I think I don't know if that's a good example, but. But that comes to mind. So he says it in 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 the pre-verbal stage. We we don't have this opportunity, right? Um, nothing quite like this can take place on a pre-articulate level. Inarticulate intelligence can only grope its way by plunging from one view of things into another, right? Knowledge acquired and held in this manner may therefore be called acritical. So I think that's an interesting point that he makes, the, the critical and the acritical. Um, <clears throat> now, um, there, there will be a couple of more twists before I get to the to the conclusion and my reflections. Um, and I think here uh, it becomes much more interesting, right? So there is this, I think this tension he is like grappling with the superiority of the two forms of knowledge, right? The explicit and the implicit. He first he says the explicit is superior because man has language at his disposal to articulate. But then he is like, no, really, I mean, what about the tacit knowledge that also has some significance? Like it may not be, um, it, it, it doesn't have the quality of the explicit knowledge. But that doesn't mean we should just get rid of it or we should eliminate it, right? Which it, it so I think in if you read the chapter, the, the lecture is fascinating when he talks about the logical oddity, is like probably to people the only solution is to eliminate whatever flaw, residual flaw is there. And residual flaw by residual flaw he means the the bias that comes from the human participation in the conduct and understanding of things in the world like me so yeah i just want to jump jump in with a very concrete example just so that people like Please. what you mean by tacit and explicit may i Please. but, but uh, riding a bike you know like we know how to ride a bike it's not necessarily intuitive if you had to try to explain to somebody how you ride a bike it's very problematic because we don't understand, like, what are we doing when we ride the bike? How does it work? Whereas, ex so that's implicit or tacit knowledge, whereas like explicit would be like, let's say, you know, all of Newton's laws, you know what angular momentum is, you know how to calculate, let's say you're an engineer, right? Like, you know how to calculate angular momentum, et cetera, et cetera. All the things that are happening with the bicycle, you know how to calculate but it still may be completely not helpful in trying to explain how you're riding the bike because you yourself may not really realize what am I doing when I ride a bike, right? It's it's the same knowledge, but in two very different forms. I'm just giving that for people to, to help them follow along better. Is that right? That's the end of my little interjection. Thanks so much. That, yeah, that, that that's fascinating. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so, so he says the question, then is if, ex if explicit knowledge is superior because it is intelligent, verbal, critical, et cetera, what is the place of its poor inarticulate sibling? That's my, you know, what, what does the tacit knowledge do? Does it 
you know, does it have any value? Does it have any significance? And he asks, this is his is words, can it still be true that it is the tacit personal component which predominates in all human thought? Uh, and then he says that the answer is this. Surely, uh, I'll read it carefully so that we understand it. Surely, one cannot but accept then the preference which has urged the human mind to overcome its pre-verbal dumbness and to unfold a great public record of articulate knowledge. So he says it's something in us which just wanted to, like, like it was not enough for us to remain in that state of pre-verbal knowledge, right? And to kind of, to, to, uh, to, to advance, to progress again, I mean, linguistics, linguists would be in a much better position to tell us about the development of language and words and writing and speech. But, but here it says that this preference of like moving away from the pre-verbal to the verbal and to the articulate um, is, is just, uh, in essence, it, the statement seems to celebrate the human capacity for communication, and this is just my understanding, and the creation of a collective body of knowledge through language and other forms of expression. The use of the word surely, for example, probably means degree of conviction or inevitability of this kind of shift, right? Um, then he, um, but so here I'll, uh, how much time do I have, Andres? So, okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up in seven, eight minutes, okay? So he doesn't stop here, right? And adds a new twist, as I earlier indicated, to the tale by arguing that, and yet this exalted valuation, as he, I just said that, oh, you know, like this, the movement from the pre-verbal to the verbal and the, the mind, the preference that, no, we have to have this articulated repository of knowledge. He says that this exalted valuation of strictly formalized thought is self-contradictory. Using the analogy of a traveler and an explorer, this is interesting. I find this interesting. So never thought about this, but um, you live and learn. He says, he writes, and I quote, it is true that the traveler equipped with a detailed map of a region across which he plans his itinerary enjoys a striking intellectual superiority over the explorer who first enters a new region. Yet the explorer's fumbling progress is a much finer achievement than the well-briefed traveler's journey. I think that's just so good. I mean, that's what poets do. That's what artists, and you know, like they just... So this is insane, that the traveler and the explorer. Moreover, he writes, and I quote, even if we admitted that an exact knowledge of the universe is our supreme mental possession, it would still follow that man's most distinguished act of thought consists in producing such knowledge. I think that's a fascinating line also, that it is not the, the outcome, it's the producing of it. And it is, he says, the tacit knowing or capability of knowing of human beings that doesn't feel satisfied. Like you have a book, right? Like you should, okay, I wrote a book. Let's say I, I write a book, I'll write a book on the Kurds and I'm like, okay, I'm done. This is over. But some, there is something in us. It's like, it doesn't dress. It's like, no, I think we need to now move on to the next and to the next. So the unformulated or the inarticulate dimension of knowledge or knowing is, he says, at the very foundation of the articulate framework that we have, right? So I'll read this line again. Even if we sub admitted that an exact knowledge of the universe is our supreme mental possession, it would still follow that man's most 
distinguished act of thought consists in producing such knowledge. The human mind is at its greatest when it brings either to uncharted domains under its control. That's fascinating. Such operations renew the existing articulate framework, as I just said. Hence, they cannot be performed within this framework, but have to rely to this extent on the kind of plunging reorientation which we share with the animals. And if you want to remember a, a line or two from, from the lecture, from the presentation, it's this fundamental novelty can be discovered only by the same tacit powers which rats use in learning a mass. Fundamental novelty can be discovered only in the same tacit powers which rats use in learning a maze. Um, so um, I, okay, so just a few quick, and then he says, there is enough evidence here to suggest that the highest tacit powers of an adult may not exceed and perhaps actually fall short of those of an animal, an animal or an infant, so that the adults in com comparably greater performances are to be ascribed predominantly to his superior cultural equipment. So he says, again, he appreciates, celebrates the power of cultural equipment or like the, the, the framework, the articulated or formulated framework that plays a role in our maturity. But he says that, you know how you might have heard of this idea that if you want to be a theorist, you should act, behave like a child. Like the genius that he, there is a very powerful line that the genius comes from the youth and the maturity, maturity comes from um, the experienced age. So like it's the combination of the two. Um, hopefully I can, I can find this line, but uh, page 19, just very quickly. Uh, uh, Genius seems to consist, okay, so here is the line. Genius seems to consist in the power of applying the originality of youth to the experience of maturity. Genius seems to consist in the power of applying the originality of youth to the experience of maturity. I think that's a powerful line. Now, the twist continues, and he argues that it is not the functions of articulate not logical operations, but the tacit powers of the mind that at all mental levels are decisive. He terms this reorganization of the experiences by the tacit powers to gain intellectual control over the explicit understanding. So this is, I think, probably the difference between... So understanding happens according to him uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Andreas uh, and Admondus, as you have read this. I, it seems to me that what happens, the processes, the operations, the intentions, and just the motivation that happens at the tacit level, he calls understanding. And then, I mean, knowing, understanding, and then when we, you know, bring that out, express it in the form of language and other equipments, tools, then it becomes this articulated knowledge. So he says that understanding is, of course, not without discovery. I think scientists, um, philosophers have um, taken issue with it. But uh, Paul and I is not a positivist, even though he's in, a, a, an opponent of positivism, uh, he because he, I think, accords importance to this pre-verbal dimension of human thought um, in his theory. Um, so he is not a positivist in 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 that sense of the word. Um, so. Okay, he, he also, um, to make this distinction between the tacit and the explicit clear, he, he makes another uh, very interesting distinction between focal awareness and subsidiary awareness. Uh, so uh, what is focal? The distinction between subsidiary awareness and focal awareness or subsidiary knowledge and focal awareness, for example, um, 
you know, you look at a table, right? And repeat the word table, and he gives this example, or any pretty much anything, 20 times, table, 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 table. If you're, and, and I think this thought is much more complicated than I'm able to probably articulate, like this whole discussion of gestalt in psychology, like the whole and the parts, probably Andres can help us with this, um, that when we say, when, when even, even like, Forget about table. If you look at your brother or like a friend, you if you focus on the friend and you look at them so much, they kind of lose meaning. Like you have to, you have to, what he says, subsidiarily focus on the friend, like as a physical object. But the 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 focal um uh, maybe yeah. maybe I can jump in because I it's very hard what he said, but can I give it a try? Please. Um, and this is the situation. This is the 1950s, 1960s that he's in. So one of the ideas of that epoch was uh, Gestalt. Gestalt was in psychology this idea that the whole is more than the sum of the parts, right? And I think he's using this to try to explain how the tacit and the uh, explicit minds, you know, the implicit and explicit minds are working together. He says a very, uh, basically what's happening is that you will be focused on something, but it's, there's something deeper there. There's like parts that are integrated into that. Okay. And so you may like um, look at your brother Okay, and he may have all kinds, he's the sum of all these things that go into him. It's a very rich meaning. But if you just stare long enough at his face, all that richness will disappear. You just see like skin, right? Like at a certain point, like you'll just see a bunch of skin, right? It'll it'll disintegrate, you know, just like you're saying, like table, 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 table. At a certain point, like there's the four legs of a table, the, the surface of the table, none of it matters. It's just table, table, you know, it's just nonsense. So that exactly. idea is that um, that is showing that there's some kind of unity, which I think is the articulate mind. The articulate mind is somehow like organizing these things. But the tacit mind is somehow providing the experiential uh, input. And so they're working together. But if it's very easy to kind of like lose that. So he's just giving this is difficult to talk about. So he'll talk about the focus and then substeria. And maybe just to explain, like, why is he talking about that? Um, he's living in a very deterministic era. So if you read in the future, you know, I read the second and part of the third. Um, very reductionist era. Reductionist is like, I think when my father was trained, you know, maybe when I was trained, like you believe, okay, there's electrons, you know, and then electrons build up molecules and the molecules build up um, into living creatures and the living creatures build up into societies and they're all determined because the electrons are all determined. And that's a very common argument to this day, but he was a very sharp critic of that. And he said, no, he goes, look, when you build a machine, right? Machines are built of electrons, but you see a machine has a purpose and that changes everything. You see, it gives a logic to the machine. If you don't know the purpose, if you just gave the machine to a physicist and says, what's going on this? The physicists will look at the electrons and how they come together and how this is works. The physicist has no concept of the purpose. The physicist can tell you nothing what really what a machine is because the physicist isn't thinking that way. So that's a case where if the focus is on the machine, the focus will be on the purpose. All the logic of the machine will come out. If you don't have the focus on the machine, you just think of these electrons. They will never tell you what a machine is. They will never tell you what a frog is. They will never tell the difference between a dead frog and a living frog. You see, it's just, it's not possible to really connect it. And so he's, what he's trying to do is by studying man and studying uh, how we are combined to be able to grapple with all these problems that we're facing because of uh, wrong, what I think he would say is like wrong thinking. And so in Wondrous Wisdom, maybe just to um, explain why I care about this uh, so much, uh, our working together, this idea that, okay, like we have three minds. So here's an example of saying, okay, or like, you know, that he's talking about two of those minds, and then understanding would be this third mind. Understanding is saying, look, 
if you want to understand a machine, you want to understand a frog, you have to empathize. You have to look at it from the frog's point of view. You have to look at it from the machine's point of view or the maker of the machine. You cannot understand, and that's true in every single science. And so history is just like every single science. You have to empathize and you have to appreciate what's going on there. So this idea to say uh, that you can, un by understanding the limits of the human imagination, by understanding, like you're saying, like how you want to know how we know, like that is the key to understanding how it all fits together, what's going on. If you ignore that, you're lost. That's the, so maybe, um, could you say like a two, three sentence conclusion, then we'll have discussion. Is that fine? Yeah. Yes. So we, yeah, that's fine. Thank you so much, Andres, for, for that help. <laughs> you rescued me. <laughs> we're grappling, uh, we're wrestling with this. It's hard. <laughs> uh, this is fascinating. So I, as I said in the beginning, I think I find his reasoning very, of course, uh, profound but it's also circuitous like it he goes back and forth it's they uh, sometimes it, it's surprising um you think oh he, he made his point but no he has not made his point he made his point to move on to the next one so he can prepare to counter the point that he made but anyway so that is his style which but the, the writing is very uh it, it's deep but it's digestible um I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the other thing is I, the study of man starts with understanding ourselves. I think how our minds work, implicitly, explicitly, tacitly. Um, I think the, uh, you know, Andres just spoke about the subsidiary and focal awareness. So I think for what I understood not from just Andreas's conversation, but from the book, is that the subsidiary awareness is the seed and the focal or the explicit is the soil. I think both are interdependent. One cannot do without the other, right? The articulate and the inarticulate or, you know, all the different words that he uses. I think these are necessarily intertwined forms of knowledge. Like, you have to have the the spark, the glow, the motivation, the matter motivation to you know, to continue to discover and explore. Like once you don't have that, I mean, it doesn't, how do we progress? How do we, what do we do? Like I have this in, even with my students, like sometimes my, I think about this, hopefully I'm not digressing, is that is my job only to teach the material or also to motivate them to learn the material? Like do people have, you know, some people are motivated, others are not. And I think that is going to be my question. So craving for understanding, not, this is not the question yet. This is a point before the question. Craving for understanding and intellectual passion impa impelling us towards making ever closer contact with reality is due to minds on the alert. So this is, I think, what I, I got from, from the book. To alert minds, whatever seems intelligible presents a problem and stirs it to the prospect of discovery. So that is, again, the role of the tacit knowing. On discovery, inventions, possibility, and hidden presence, there is a very nice uh, line. I mean, a paragraph. I, I don't have time. I think we don't have time. Oh, so I'll see. just... Yeah. Huh? What, what is your question? That's Why don't you the conclude question with your question? Is that, I think the question is this. Um, are all minds the same? Because it seems like he... It is a given for him that that all minds tacitly are the same. Um, I mean, I don't want to put words in his in his theory or in his mouth. Do all minds have the craving craving for understanding? He doesn't seem to answer this. I think um, we probably assume, as I said in the beginning, we're all thinkers. But to what degree and what that means? What does that imply? Um, also, I think related to this, maybe in other words, is tacit knowledge or knowing a given? What is that determined by? Is it is tacit knowledge a given or is it determined by other things? So I guess that's also the, the question of priori, a priori, opus, a priori, posteriori, and those clean slate, those, those kinds of ideas. So that is the end. I'm sorry, I took... Uh, that's okay. Your love of the subject of the author is uh, palpable. Uh, your question was, are all minds the same? Do all minds have the same craving for understanding? 
And so um, let's give a round of applause and then the floor is for those who seize it, please. Maybe, maybe uh, if you if you like, uh, you can raise your hand. I'll call on you. Is that good? Uh, or you can just jump in. You know, I, I why don't I moderate? But uh, my father, Edmund, does please. I, I I need to attend to some other things, so I have to sign off. But I, I do have a couple of questions. One is, where does the soul? I mean, where does the soul fit into all this? I mean, we know about the heart. We know about some of these. Uh, implicit, explicit things, and and so on, but uh, in the in, in in the system, I mean, the electrons, the protons, and so on. Is there a soul? The other question is: uh, Have have are there have there been experiments where uh, monkeys, right after birth, or ch chimpanzees, were attempted uh, uh, to? Uh, to be uh, taught language, if 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 they were and they couldn't speak, that means there must be more than just the language. I mean, there must be other processes or 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 uh, well capabilities that the human has, but the animals or well, the chimpanzees don't. So I have to sign off, but I. Well, uh, I'll just stay for a bit to, to hear any responses to those two questions. We welcome it. Who would respond? Aslam, can you can you handle that, or can Christopher? Maybe Christopher. Well, first about the soul. Where does that, I mean, we do we feel? I feel I have a soul. I don't know what happens to the body, and I mean, when the body dies and the soul, I guess it still exists. So I guess that's a sub, sub, separate subject all by itself, I guess. But uh, look, maybe it's, let's, let's start with the easier question, the, the chimpanzee and, and speech. Are there any experience, have any experiments been, uh, been done? Do you know, do you know knowledge? I can answer that. Uh... Uh, experiments have been done with chimpanzees, I think also with gorillas and with the different apes. And I think basically, uh, see, they have problems with vocal cords. So what they do instead is they'll use computer screens and things like that to make it easier for the chimps to use a language, a human-like language. They can learn like, you know, 500 or 1,000 words. I mean, they can learn a lot of words. They can make simple sentences very simple sentences like, you know, eat banana <laughs> or, um, and uh, they can, um, but there's something called uh, like, like linear order they can do, but like there's a certain syntactical thing that they just have trouble with. So, but, uh, okay. So my question is, I mean, okay, fine. They can say, say the words. Do they, do they have an understanding of the meaning? Yes, they do. And so they, they can, you can so, communicate with them and they can, oh. they can, they can oh, do that. Uh, yeah, that's, it's impressive. Okay, well, but that, they uh, can't, there's certain syntactic limitations to that, like certain sentence structures. Mm -hmm. So they can look they, into they can be taught to, uh, taught to speak, right? I mean, they don't make okay. sounds. What they use, they'll use like a computer keyboard. They can, you know, oh. they can type. <laughs> so it's their more advanced things. Mm -hmm. Or use touch screens. Okay, so so well about the soul, maybe next next time. But I have to sign off. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, very interesting. Uh, thank, thank you, you for being. the question. Soul, I mean that's that's such a powerful question. I just yeah. It, you almost I, I it shook me from inside. Uh, Chris, Chris wants to say something. Let Chris yeah. say. yeah, maybe I can add something like that on that. First, thank you, Aslam. For me, all this makes a lot of sense, what you are saying. But for example, Arthur Reber, he, he says that all species develops unconsciously or subconsciously. So, so the, the main uh, core of us is subconscious. Um, do you hear... I can hear you. Yeah. yeah so, sure. <clears throat> and since everything is, since everything is um, uh, electromagnetic energy, 
both the the knowledge but also the processes are electromagnetic devices that can do certain things prioritize associate uh, and so on and also the soul is also an electromagnetic um, device is it uh, does it exist after the body dies yes it does mm -hmm. but it doesn't exist in at uh, what do you say um it comes into the body into the uh, womb after a certain period of time when it when it satisfy a certain electromagnetic field so that it has the possibility to associate with the um, what do you say the little child in the bar, in the in the womb so everything is electromagnet electromagnetic field patterns otherwise how could we associate how can we prioritize that's a tool so um so anyway what you what you said uh, make perfect sense for me anyway well, thank you very much and uh, goodbye for now. Uh, I'll, uh, if there's more discussion, I guess it'll be re it'll be recorded and I will I'll read it. For yes. us. Thank you, Ed. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, good job, Aslam. I got a lot out of the talk. Uh, I'm looking forward to learning more on the subject. I don't have any out of the ordinary questions now, but uh, I can write you later. Uh, thanks for. A great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. S Samuel is there? Is that correct? Or do you have a comment? Or Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I've just been kind of passively listening. I'm at work training. Um, but I did have some thoughts about um, the tacit knowledge and, and what you were saying about like you, you don't really know, like a physicist doesn't know the purpose of a machine, right? And in the same way, it's almost like we don't know the purpose of tacit knowledge because we didn't create it. You know, we're not the creator of this knowledge. We just inherited it. And, um, and, and this kind of goes all the way down to like, we didn't create ourselves, ourselves like self-organized. And we don't even know how they did that. They didn't even share the implicit knowledge of how we became who we are. So I definitely think that <clears throat> tacit knowledge sort of rules the day because we are made of tacit knowledge. And like ourselves don't necessarily have a language to communicate with us how they self-organized into being us. So that was kind of my thoughts. Um, wow, you and then like the, the whole soul question is really just asking what is how do you make that tacit knowledge implicit? Because we know we exist, but we don't know why we exist. We don't know what motivated the cells to organize beyond a single cell why do you need multiple cells we don't know we can't ask them you know <laughs> so that's that's kind of my reflection on the discussion wow that's deep that's uh, beautiful that's always always deep 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 thoughts sam yep <laughs> i'm just in here cleaning a bathroom you know just <laughs> Scholars clean toilets. I think Never. you should give you should give a talk on this. <laughs> Get the money Deep thoughts. <laughs> Kirby, well, Brent. see, you uh, just <laughs> sorry. Thank you for being with us, Samuel. That's a real treat, Kirby. I know, yeah, I know we're Thank we're talking on, we're talking on the list a lot about. Uh, unconscious ego and versus ego and so on it seems like there's a way to overlap these vocabularies the tacit seems to be kind of the unconscious like we don't know some of the things we think 
we think we know certain things until we try to explicitly share them with others. And when it comes out, it's like, wow, other people don't even believe that. I thought I was, you know, you, things that you can believe tacitly, you might think or feel like everyone around you, the whole world kind of has that assumption. You feel because you've never articulated it. But sometimes what happens is you'll express something that you take for granted and you'll realize it's not, there's no consensus at all about that. And that can seem, that can seem harsh in a way that can seem difficult to have your tacit knowledge no longer taken for granted. I guess tacit to me means what we take for granted. We don't even question. And that's why he says, and by the way, I found it on archive.org, the complete book. I checked it out just for fun. And so while we're talking here, I've just kind of been browsing through that first mm -hmm. lecture and looking at the the prose that we're quoting and stuff, trying to get my mind around it. But yeah, yeah I think uh, tacit knowledge is most of what we know uh, in that quote unquote no sense that we don't, like Popper says, you know, real knowledge or whatever scientific knowledge is the kind that can be falsified. Whereas I think tacit knowledge which is the majority of our knowledge, we don't, uh, it's not falsifiable because we don't articulate it. We don't even bring it up to the surface enough to where it can be peer reviewed, I would guess is a way to say it. So we live in a world where we're mostly not peer reviewed. And sometimes we're shocked when we try to express our tacit knowledge to find that we don't share consensus with others on it. Deep meets deep. Very good. <laughs> Brent? So when do you acquire tacit knowledge and what what type of part of tacit knowledge is intuition? Just kind of maybe that's because you're talk, also talking about genius kind of applied to I guess what already is known by society or literature. Hmm. So, I mean, sometimes you can kind of seemingly have an intuition about how something works, but not really be able to explain why. And then after further an investigation, you find out that you're correct. Um, Maybe I could jump in with some ideas. This is what was uh, Sorry, apologies. Uh, so, uh, oh, sorry. Andrew? Andres, maybe you can. Yeah, I wanted to just, uh, I think I understood Brent. Uh, he was uh, referring to the quote that she read about genius and that there's the two parts, uh, the childish type of um, uh, look and then the person has experience, right? And so I'll explain it in the language of wondrous wisdom that... Uh, um, and just to say, like, in our community, uh, we have champions of the unconscious. So Jinan would, you know, maybe be grappling with the Polyan, Polyani uh, because, but, and so, or for example, um, Jerry says that everything is consciousness, right? But what, and so we want all these views to flourish because we benefit from that. You know, if, if they can push this and they can share that, that's helpful for us. I think where I'm expecting it would lead to, though, is this acknowledgement of balance, right? Like, because if everything is unconscious, let's say, I mean, if everything is consciousness, like all the electrons are conscious and everything, et cetera, well, then where does the unconscious come from? Do you see, like, if all these things are, like, if all the cells are, you know, have consciousness, right? Okay, but how do they relate to us? So it becomes difficult to talk about the unconscious if everything has consciousness in it, you know, it's at least a challenge. And vice versa, uh, if you have the unconscious, well, and it has all these merits and glories, well, what about the conscious, right? Like, why do we need a conscious? Why is it there, right? Is it just a mistake or a horrible accident? No, I think it's clear that uh, these different minds are contributing different things. And so the author is teasing this apart. So one of the things uh, when we study, uh, you know, whether it, maybe it's Freud or whether it's like uh, thinking fast and slow, these psychologists, et cetera, like, 
we're finding different because it was a taboo to talk about unconscious and conscious. So these psychologists said, let's just call them system one and system two. And they found all kinds of uh, um, different types of biases that sometimes we have bias of the fast thinking mind. Sometimes we have bias from the slow thinking mind, you see, and it's, they can study this uh, statistically, you know, in, in, in the lab, you know, in the psycho psychology, psychology lab. But basically my claim is that the mind uh, that knows, you know, is this unconscious. And so let's say it's 200 billion neurons, right? But we also want a mind that does not know. We want to be able to, um, and the more you evolve, the more resources you want to spend on um, modeling what you don't know, being prepared for what you, you, you've you never encountered, right? So you might want to have like one hemisphere based on what you know, that's intuitive, instinctive mind. But another, you know, maybe an equal part of your mind that'd be based on saying, well, but what if we don't know, how do we deal with it? So you have this mind that does not know that uh, inquires and that kind of restates that. Now, what are the advantages? If you want something novel, you, you use the mind that, no, they're all different. You know, we each have a different personality in that sense, like we each have a different soul, right? So that mind that uh, is different uh, will be coming from our different experiences, et cetera. Now, um, it helps, like Krista keeps encouraging, like, well, we want to feed it with different uh, experiences so that, it, you know, I mean, these are basically prejudice. It's like BS, like, you know, chat GPT gives BS. Well, that's the BS mind. It knows, you know, it, it's not very self-critical. So, but so you want to feed it all different kinds of things so that it's able to uh, have different points of view. Who does the feeding? So you see this mind that does not know, the articulate mind is formulating questions that are kind of like making sure, hey, like, can we check, can we not? So uh, novelty is not gonna come from that mind, but this idea, like you said, this uh, articulateness, like that you can share things because our private personal world, we don't even share it with ourselves. We're not really aware of where these ideas are coming from. How can we share it with other people? You know, these things that make unique. But see the things that we don't know that can be the same in all of us, you see. So this idea that like take all the liquid, you know, in your vessel and pour it out and just ignore all your experience. What are you left with? You see, you have an empty mind. That's very valuable. You can share your empty mind with, you know, somebody else's empty mind and you can have a language in terms of this empty mind. Now, so those things are very complicated in terms of like, how do they, and they tend to get intertwined. It's a big mess. So that's why I'm saying you need a third mind. Maybe it's in the basal ganglia or et cetera, but it, 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 it relates these two. And so in Pol Polanyi, if I got that right, uh, he's talking about understanding. He's saying you need to be able to have this third you know, meta thinking that says, hey, we understand that really the tacit is the storehouse. The unconscious is the storehouse. But we need to be able to empathize with that. We need to be able to articulate that. But in order to articulate it and make it shareable, we need to really empathize with it and put it in the center of the world. So when you look at those like, um, so that's, ex and you'll see in the future chapters, he says, that's what great scientists do, whether they're historians or biologists or physicists, they're able to identify, you know, with the frog or with the uh, machine or with the Napoleon, you know, they're able to kind of identify, empathy with that. So that's exactly the method I'm using when I try to say, let's make a cheat sheet for biology, okay? Like the 24 ways of figuring that, or for sociology like we did, right? So let's study the sociologist and identify with the sociologist. Let's understand the sociologist, what? you see? And then we will get a whole system. Yeah. So in sociology, the key thing was this question of self-identity, oh, saying okay. that, hey, how do you determine self-identity? People don't even know who they are are they Pashtun or are they men or are they, you know, educated or are they, you know, peaceful people? You know, who knows? Like, how do you get that out of them? And if you, the government asked them, the government might not be able to get the right answer, but who who would be the, how would you get that out? That seems to be the central question in sociology. So every discipline, like math, it's like, how do you configure all these states with a symmetric group? You know, like, how do you get this symmetry group that permits all the possibilities? Like every discipline has this kind of like, observer and that's what you're trying to empathize with so 
I think that's, I forget, maybe there's a question, but like that's this kind of vision where this is going. And maybe just to conclude, uh, and we'll have more discussion, but I want to end like with what would we like to do? But so Jerry Northrup, um, he has uh, this, we have this language of wisdom study group, but he would like to practically apply all of this timberfish technology that he's developed over the years and over his lifetime. So I'm really saying one thing we should do, every discipline, but also every personality has their own ways of figuring things out. I and maybe others, you know, should sit down with him and say, hey, tell us all the ways you figure things out with your like ecological resource management, waste management systems, and you will be the key to figuring out how to put together these modules, you see. So let's make a science out of you. What would you call that science? And let's make that. So that would be something where um, I think it would be nice to try. You know, we can do it for dis different disciplines. So, but make a cheat sheet for Jerry Northrup. And then try to see, well, how, in his case, how can we have a, um, a way of putting things together? Because what we talked about last time with abduction, you know, where sometimes abduction is um, coming up with hypothesis, but sometimes it's this probing. You know, you talked about this probing, like this exploring, you know, like that you try to play around with things, right? So how do we... Um, take those and and maybe just to go like he had those two different three cycles the pierce one the Andrus one he had them actually basically as modules that are going down one for the tacit mind one for the explicit mind one for the understanding mind they kind of go down chain become more and more abstract as you go down deeper you know so um if you um have these um if you have these uh cycles or like can that help? Oh, the th that the concluding idea I want to have was that, you see, that's how nature works. And so it's, we are in nature, we are communicating with nature, we are natural. And so we can be having, so sociology may be based on this natural language, perhaps, or whatever, like, how do we hook into nature, into each other, etc., in this kind of way. And he's giving us very far on that way, like how we hook into each other. So these were a bit of ideas. Um, who, what more is bubbling out of us? And then maybe we'll try to see, like, what would we like to see in for our sociology study group? What kind of questions would we like to be studying? Christo. Well, I was thinking about uh, the, 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 the fish tank. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was thinking about empathy. Mm -hmm. So in this group, a relevant question for me is, is it OK? to have fish in a fish tank, for example, is that morally right? Mm -hmm. Because can we empathize with the fish? Well, and so that's a question, it's noted, you know, we can bring it up with Jerry, you know, I think, um, one maybe just to relate to that, you know, uh, that's another top. So one of the conclusions from our talk with Jerry was that to have this uh, eco net, to say let's have a bunch of do-it-yourselfers around the world helping each other with their failures and successes. So as sociologists, we could try to make that type of network work. You know, where you can just start with a fifty-five you know gallon drum, but then you may say, hey, my fish aren't happy. You know, like what would it take for them to be happier or whatever. Now, a second thing is that um, as uh, this is something I learned organizing um, practical application of philosophy every every two weeks. This was in Chicago, like 1995, many years ago. But we would have these discussions in developing this ap practical application. But what I noticed was, and we may have a little bit of this here, sometimes people step in. They're engrossed in their own thinking, right? They're sharing, right? And other people like Kirby sitting back and watching, like, how is this all dynamic going? But then Kirby will step in. Then Andres, let's say, will be sitting back and watching. So different people, it's like a flutter of the Holy Spirit. You know, one person step in, one person steps out, one person step in. So there's a stepping in and stepping out. Now, if you play with a puppy, you see, but certainly with a baby, like if you play with a baby, if the baby stepped in, you can step out. And by stepping out, you can encourage the baby to step out. And then you step in, you see, or vice versa. Like you try to play, you know, get it to step in, step out, step in, step out. 
So what this what this does is that once you can get it to switch back and forth, then you can get it to flirt so that the things are very equal. Then it becomes in a situation of control, like for consciousness. You see, so consciousness is when you are able to decide, do I want to step in? Do I want to step out? It's up to me, you see. So babies are very good at like learning that and kind of becoming more and more conscious because we're not, we don't have consciousness all the time. But like with a puppy, I think you can do the same with a puppy because a puppy, you can step in and it can step out. And I think if you love, love makes it possible to have the stepping in and stepping out. I think you could do it with a fish tank. I think you could do it with a pile of, uh, you know, biological gook. You just have to know like what is stepping in and what is stepping out and be able to flirt with the boundary. What the conclusion would be like any system could become basically, con the consciousness could be brought out. You could be communicating with it. I think people would love that. So then you could ask the fish, do you mind that we eat you, for example, right? Are you happy, like, you know, or not? See, then that would be, let, we let the fish decide. Okay, Krista, please. I put the question because I think that humanity is very creative, mm -hmm. but really stupid. Mm -hmm. so, so there is no lack of solutions, but there is a, a huge lack of wisdom. And that is almost like comparing with a, building a house. If you if you don't have the, what do you say, the fundamental of the house that you build the house on? The foundation. The, the foundation. foundation. The, so foundation for me is wisdom. So if you don't have the wisdom and you try to build a house or you're trying to build solutions on that foundation, it will not be very uh, successful. So just to try to understand uh, the impact of wisdom. So it could be that we should involve in wisdom development, but not so much in finding solutions and implementation. So, yeah, I, I don't have a, another analogy that is that is good. Aslam, did um, you want to say something? Mm -hmm. Just a question. Fascinating conversation. So my question is to Krista. Maybe mm, you can talk about it now, but or this could could be um, a talk in the future. Do you think wisdom? When we say wisdom. Um, do we mean the same thing? Is there one singular definition of wisdom? Because I think when we look across the globe in different traditions and cultures and places, wisdom probably means, I mean, I'm not sure, like, I'm just wondering, I'm curious. Do we have an underlying, like, do we have a definition that we could agree on? Right. Um, I I don't know. Just just a question. For me, wisdom is always context based. If you are in the jungle, or if you are the president of the United States, for example. But a definition of wisdom that, for example, it is the ability to foresee, understand, and act on situations in a way that is long term and favorable for all involved. That could be general. Can I interject here for a sec? Yeah, please. I've been, no, kind no. Of reflect, I've been reflecting on um, a tidbit from earlier in the conversation about, um, you know, having a map versus being an explorer. And I, I, I think when we come to, um, to the question of what is wisdom, it's, it's not about whether or not you have a map or whether or not you're exploring. It's whether or not you make it to the destination, right? And and so you can get there with or without the map. And um, and I think we tend to get hung up on methodology in terms of like, well, you know, do we have a map 
is it in the right language is it you know a universal language or whatever and and the point is to just get there you know and um and i think wisdom is basically in, in my in my interpretation you know what's better than the best map not needing a map right just knowing where you're going um and being able to read the signs in the moment it, it, it you know i don't know maybe i can't articulate it further than that but it's like a it's like the birds right the birds don't need a map they have it sort of already in them they know which direction is north that could be seen as a form of kind of primordial wisdom that's like dormant within them you know and and when we go searching for wisdom we're really just we're looking for permission to go down that same rabbit hole within ourselves i think and um and and go in the direction that we want because you know it's like we we spend a lot of time talking and what we really want to be doing is doing um and i think that's that that's wisdom you know doing D wisdom is like a it's stored in the body not just necessarily the mind i think so anyways those are my reflections on Very what helpful. we were just discussing kirby um this i want to branch off from earlier conversation about communicating with non-humans and our thoughts about intelligence wisdom like i do like the question can we find where do we find wisdom outside humanity as just kind of an open question i don't have an answer to that but on the topic of talking with um <clears throat> apes uh, my roommate's wife was a volunteer on the Coco project, and that mm. was a gorilla named Coco. And in that case, it was American Sign Language, right? They taught the yeah, gorilla right. how to mm -hmm. signify that way. And they had a parrot, a pet parrot, my friends Rick and Candy. Candy was a volunteer. Uh, and they would brag when you'd go to their house, the parrot was allowed to just fly around the house. It had a tree that it but it was named by Coco, they said, because for a while, Coco and the gorilla somehow lived together. And Coco named uh, the parrot Red Devil. And to this, to them, it was showing that not only did Coco understand American Sign Language, but could even come up with names for new objects or things like that. That's how they saw it. But there's a lot of interpretation, of course, People don't just take the same empirical uh, results and interpret the same way. So I'm not arguing right now about whether that's true. The other the other major experiment I'll just mention briefly, because I think it's highly entertaining, was to attempt to talk to dolphins, right? And they had tanks and they had dolphins. And the wild card there was John Lilly, if you read his work, I've read some of it. It's very strict and rigorous feeling. Like he writes in a very scientific way, but he had the crazy idea. I'm just crazy in quotes that the best way to reach out and talk to the dolphins was to take a lot of LSD and float above them in another tank and establish telepathic connection. And this is where consensus breaks down right like he to him that makes sense but to carl sagan who was helping to fund the whole project that was like absolutely nuts right and even more interesting is that lily felt he had made contact and this goes to the question of is it ethical to keep these fish in a tank he felt he even was negotiating with the dolphins as to whether it was okay to extend this period of study because, you know, they were being held somewhere. And it's like, hey, dolphins, you know, I know we said until May this year, but we'd like to have you here another six months. Is that okay? And he's, he reported back that, yeah, okay, the dolphins said okay and stuff like that. Very funny story, in my opinion, just because it proves that people who consider themselves 
rigorously scientific can still be on completely different wavelengths as far as what they think reality uh, permits. I think we're not going to resolve that in any particular generation. Like I'm not going to, I don't sit around part of my wisdom. I'll just say it this way. I'm not waiting to see my point of view proved correct. And everyone else is going to bow down and say, yes, Kirby, that's never going to happen. And I think it's wise that we all surrender that fantasy of when I'm proved right, you know, that's not never, never. Anyway. Thank you, Krister. Yeah, I want to build on that because I think that we misunderstand what wisdom is, that wisdom is something just inside of us. Um, for example, Nikola Tesla, he said that he saw all his inventions. So that we, our network, our wisdom network goes far beyond us. So that was... Thank it. you. And Bill, are you going to stay, share your wisdom? Are you there with us? Give you a chance. Um, I do. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, go I'm, ahead. Yeah. We're listening. I just was reading an article about how entropy may have a big influence on how consciousness evolved. Uh, that's the only thing that I have that would be novel mm -hmm. right now. Uh, it's all very interesting stuff. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll forward you that link if I can find it, Andreas. And if you yeah. want, I'll forward it to Well, if you think, uh, send it to the group. But it's always good to write one sentence. Like, why do you think this is interesting, right? Like, if you just send a link, it's a little bit... Uh, like uh, Nick Christer said... Context, you know, give us some context, either like why you think it's interesting or what it's about. Okay, I know that you're pretty sure. careful in terms of the links you send, so you can send. Yeah. Okay? okay, and uh, we'll be concluding soon. I just uh, want to um, just uh, have a few minutes to um, think about what, especially what Islam would like, you know. But what would we like to be studying? You know, what questions you have? This question that you gave. Uh, do we? Um, well, I think the original one was, um, are we all the same? Is that right? As people? And do we mean the same thing by wisdom? Something like that, right? So you you formulate that. I'll just say that uh, unlike Kirby, you know, I do want to figure it all out. And, you know, if people give me credit or not, that doesn't matter so much. But like I would say, according to wondrous wisdom, like wisdom is knowledge why, Okay. So maybe it's the opposite of what Christer says, because like knowledge why means you're able to let go of context. You're able to say, like you're able to get outside of your context. So um, now, it, now kind of like what uh, Paul Lanyi is saying is like, well, the understanding maybe, so maybe that's not wisdom, but understanding is able to take anybody's context and receive it. Like, you know, you love biology so much, then you're able to look into that frog's eye and say, I, I think I know you. You see, I like you. So um, there's that side, but that may not necessarily be wisdom. That may be something else. But wisdom is really to be able to shut down your experience, let go of it, and just let go of all your context and see where that leads. And the foundation is not, uh, certainly not uh, what you're saying, uh, like, you know, what's better for everybody. We don't have a clue, like if we let go of our context. The foundation is the three cycle of the learning method. Like you take a stand, you follow through, you reflect. So by doing, you see, and by thinking about it, and then by coming with conclusions, that is the foundation on which everything rests, the motor of the soul. So to tell people, oh, no, you should not apply this until you have wisdom, that is the wrong foundation. The right foundation is that, no, you need to be working practically. So I'm able to introduce a lot here because uh, inspired by Jerry saying, and he's 80 years old. He doesn't want to wait for wisdom. He's, 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 we want to draw the wisdom that he has. So that's, you know, so you can agree with that or not, but I'm just saying that uh, there are these structures. They say these things. Uh, they say that um, we need a balance. You know, and then how does this work? I describe the rules for this balance. So, so maybe uh, I got to say mine, we got to say ours. 
but uh, starting with Aslam, like what are the questions that you would like to study and who has additional questions that they would like to study? So, so I put in the chat, um, are all minds the same at the tacit and or explicit level? Do all minds have craving for understanding? Are all minds the same at the tacit or an explicit level? Do all minds have the craving for understanding? And so just to say about wondrous wisdom, you know, this could be wrong, but like on the tacit level, like we're all different because we have all different experiences, associations, the brains are just built up differently, right? I mean, like, you know, there's maybe certain pieces that were, but it's absolutely private. We don't even know ourselves. But when you remove all that explicitly, the idea is that that starts to become um, similarities. You know, we see that there's there's universality, but especially the consciousness that tries to relate the two, you see, that consciousness is a very tight language and that consciousness, you know, these divisions of everything, like which kind of telling about how, you know, what are the ways of taking a focus and subsidiary, how can they be put together, that kind of thing. That is very well defined and that's absolutely universal to all systems. Okay, so that would be, that would be, but we can, but the point being that you have this question, okay, this is just what I'm spouting, but like, how is it really, right? Like you would like to really pursue that, right? And do all minds have the craving for understanding? By understanding, you mean what Polanyi meant by understanding, is that right? And so then the idea is that like every person has a personality. So every person is a scientific discipline. Now, do they care about themselves? Do they care about other people to empathize with them, right? Like, and and then to empathize with them. So that's a question. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, okay. So those are your questions. Um, who else has more questions? Or Kirby has a. He says explicit, open to peer review, pushback, contradiction. That's interesting. Right. As it unarticulated and therefore mostly unchallenged. Right. Wow. That's interesting. Who, who would like to um we'll be able to talk about the dialogue component of this, how the dialogue went. I'm sure Krista will have comments, maybe for the uh for the um you know, email group. But most important right now, we just have a few minutes maybe to say like what are other questions we would like to uh like maybe I'll add mine. Um this idea of um sociology as a uh I guess like a, a helpful way to figure out, like could we help someone like Jerry Northrup and me make this Econet, let's say, work, right? Is that something that would be interesting to be supportive of? Is that, uh, like what would that mean? How would it work to have this modular society where people are building their own local attempts at resource management, explaining what succeeds and fails, sharing that knowledge, you know, attention to small projects and how they can grow and fit together and be nice. Or I don't know if that's, that's applied sociology potential. I think what you're asking is important, Andreas, because I'm aware of many of these like mini projects that seem to be very scalable, like the timberfish. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? Because the world seems to be, um, spreading the news of viable solutions and things like this, it, it would seem to me that's something that we could think of as applied sociology. And I wonder if if we increase our wisdom collectively, I, I have a lot to say about that. I'm not going to right now, but I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation on the listserv. I'll just put it that way. I did a blog post during this talk kind of streaming consciousness, my way of taking notes. In mm -hmm. my subculture, in my subculture, let's just give a picture of anthropology. You know, I hang out with the Python people. I go to computer conferences. I'm always in these computer conferences, at least when we're not having a pandemic. And in those situations, it's considered not rude. It's okay right. if everybody opens their laptop, even while the speaker is speaking. So there's somebody up front, maybe it's a keynote, maybe it's a workshop, mm -hmm. but everyone has their laptop open. And so when I sit down at a meeting like this, of course, we're doing Zoom. So my laptop's open and my impulse is just to start blogging and tweeting and like bringing but and reading the book that we're talking about. Do it all at once, multitask, and then distill it 
while I'm sitting here. So I did that as kind of my subculture. But I know other subcultures, it's highly rude to open your laptop right when someone else is about to give a talk. I mean, you don't do that in like some situations. I think that's, I think for me, sociology and, and anthropology, they tie up with the personal skill of how do you travel around the world, right? I think there's wisdom that, that you can learn only from doing that from being in other cultures and that kind of sensitivity, what's appropriate, what's not. Somehow I don't want to lose sight of that kind of wisdom as we talk, because I do have this vision of dispatching a math for wisdom person to a trouble situation. Right. Also, yeah. mi mi mix missed this opening, but when we were sort of killing time for half an hour, I pictured this sort of comic book thing where because we're wise and it's math or wisdom if there's a trouble spot in the world we'll just send andreas there and he'll deal with it you know solve this or that or christian so, right or, or yeah Daniel. any one of us yeah we won't make it all be you you've already done your thing so I don't mind. Yes, sit back. you're, you're I, in the but, back of the line <laughs> but i do i want to ask us lump for thank you kirby i want to ask us lump for permission so if we pursue your question are all minds the same at the tacit and or explicit level and then to say, okay, we're going to be, you know, meanwhile, in this other study group, we're building this uh, counterparts to HTML. You know, we're building this thing that would be the backbone for the, you know, or the infrastructure for the econet, let's say. And that this, these modules, you see, they're all personal. They're all like um, specific to the location, but can they fit into a general framework? And what is it that they can share? And what is it that they don't need to share? You see, that's very, I would very much like to try to relate it to that. Is that okay if I try to apply, you know, as you investigate, as we investigate with you, is it okay if I try to apply that? And Of course, of course. I I have yet to, and then I'll let uh, Christo speak, you know, quick moment. I've yet to uh, know Jerry's, I don't think I'm familiar with uh, Jerry's work. Um, he was here last time, but he did not speak too much, but uh, he couldn't come today because uh, he had another thing to go to. I, okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. He was here last year. Yes, the, uh, last time, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, totally. So uh, I just want to us to know, or I want to know, so for next uh, meeting, what are we doing? Are we exploring this question? And then... And why don't we explore your question exactly, right? Like, can you prepare can something you and I prepare something, like some thoughts? Or my, and you, yeah. if you want, would you like to continue with Polanyi or you want to lead him? I think I him? would uh, like to continue with this baby. Okay, book. that's good. And so uh, then my, why don't you do that? And then would we like this? Krista, what do you think of the discussion today? Is it related to what you like or is it very completely different? I think that well, all of us believes this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So... Um, well, you... So we have a question for next time. Are all minds the same at the test and explicit level? I like the idea that, you know, Aslam gives a presentation, maybe keep it a little bit shorter, like 20, 25 minutes, because you were like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. This time, right? this is a shorter chapter. More, a little bit uh, more discipline. But, uh, but I like that, that you're feeding us, like you're, we're the fish, you're feeding us the worms, right? But then we have this energy, right? And so then uh, maybe, Christian, would you be willing to kind of like uh, play my... I was a moderator today, but would you like to play that role? Is that yeah. fine? Yeah, it could. But it works fine. It works so, fine. And yeah. so, but this is, you don't have to, this is kind of like in the math for wisdom style, like this is recorded, you see, that for these types of questions, it's it's very valuable that it's recorded uh, because uh, we want to share it. We want to document. We want to be able to re-listen to it. Uh, we want to invite other people. So we'll make some modification, you know, but at least in terms of uh, watching you as a moderator, I think that'd be very nice for us uh, for this. Uh, yes, Krista. Yeah, so so the the that's not not really a difference. It, when we have a dialogue, we calm it down. We let a small pause let in. Um, we don't talk too much, uh, and we try to express ourselves um, concentrated. But otherwise, it it's function quite well so you'll you'll get you know you'll be able to be the moderator and you'll be able to kind of you know give us a flavor of how you do it i will though uh take the last uh, like we did today kind of like conclude it so that we know for the next time where we're going to go further okay like you know what do we draw from this so krista yes 
Yeah, I had I just wanted to add it concerning the fish tank. Fish tank. I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, I have written. I've written a, a report of, of the future food system. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's it's very complicated. Okay, but you don't think it's a good idea to have fish tanks or? No. Okay, so fish tank maybe is the wrong word. Uh, these are, uh, but Jerry Northrup has like 50 years experience and or 60 years experience is probably more accurate, like in terms of these huge systems, different kinds. So this is working with what he wants to do. So I'm supporting him. So you can have whatever opinion you like about this. Uh, okay. but, um, I, I, but this is what's happening maybe to say. My view is that we have a lot of inventors on this planet. Mm -hmm. So they, they will have different um, um, so platforms mm -hmm. to spread their world, word. But I don't think it's our um, task to do that. This is not, uh, maybe to say, this is not our, this is me. I'm yeah, Andres, okay. I am Andres Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. Uh, and so um, you don't uh, <laughs> you don't get to say the we word. We don't really use the we word here. I mean, it's a it's a maybe that's a complicated question. Maybe that's kind of related to uh, Aslam's question, uh, like you know, uh, are all minds the same at the test? Of, you know, do well like in because can we have a we? Do we need a we? But I'm trying to create an environment where we don't need a we. Okay, and so as soon as you appeal to the we, I just say wrong group. You know. But I, but the thing is, is that Jerry has an eye. I deeply respect his eye. I'm supportive of his eye, and I want to leverage his eye. You have an eye. I'm supportive of your eye. Please, Samuel. I just wanted to throw something in there that might be relevant to your uh, pursuit. Um, there's something called open value networks that oh. I learned about in Montreal with Brent, and it's basically a way of different small uh projects diy peer-to-peer -peer, whatever you want to call it organizations or whatever groups and it's a way for them to collaborate um and like kind of share value it's it's called an open value network um when i get done with the work maybe i could like email that to the group or something but uh that's a I fantastic thought that might be helpful it's extremely helpful you remember because, Brent... thing, because the thing is we have we live in a world where there's like billions of people and generally somebody's already doing what you think should be done we just mm -hmm. don't have a way of communicating with them so that's kind of i think the point is like why reinvent the wheel when we could re when we could invent the wheel together with people who already have massive you know head start in front of us so so I think that'd be a good um, thing to look into. Samuel, Brent, Aslam, and I all met at the Let Me Think Scholarship Workshop. Brent was deeply into what he called uh, value flows, which are very much related to this open value network. Then uh, Samuel and Brent made on a road trip to Montreal, I think it was, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, um, yeah, I think uh, maybe I'm, I'll, I'll try. And so they have a lab. So they, they have a science lab, mm -hmm. and it's open to the public. And the way they do it is they chart all of your contributions to their lab. So that way, if you go to one of their, uh, you know, another lab somewhere else in the world, they can look at your contributions and say, okay, you have experience using these tools, their equipment. And so they have kind of like a pre, um, pre vetted kind of trust in you, you know? So, I'll reach out That's to That's just Brent. one application, but you know, it could, yeah, yeah. So I'll Probably reach out to- Probably want to elaborate on this more outside of this. We'll we'll do this and maybe in a month or so, uh, maybe Brent will be able to, you know, we'll hook into Brent as a resource. And of course you you remind it, and you also know a bit about this. So that's very helpful. Um, Samuel, any question that you would like to see in sociology? I mean, which could, you know, this could include this as well. Hmm, yeah, I, I guess going, Going back to your whole the whole dolphin guy uh, on LSD, it kind of raised the question for me: Are there any legitimate roles for psychedelics in the current scientific atmosphere or sociological atmosphere that could be 
you know, taken seriously and, um, and explore some of the depth of, you know, the subconscious or whatever you want to call it. That's, that's something I'm fascinated in is like, how do we shift what's treated as legitimate or illegitimate or, you know, what is the basis of that? Right. So, and, and in particular psychedelics, right. So that's, I just want to say we've done a lot of circling of that topic on the list as a potential focus, including of this group, right? Just the whole question. Right. What are the legitimate use cases or roles or, you know? Well, what and we'd lump that, we, we could lump that in with a broader topic of like, if you are on the other side of things and trying to get off of any kind of substance or like what is the effectiveness what works when it comes to you know detoxification but then on your side what we're talking about what works if you're trying to talk to dolphins you know <laughs> right or well i mean what other use cases are there you know are you what if you're trying to talk talk to your subconscious or something or 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 to yeah, stop I, talking you know how when do I we took stop a, our minds from producing words when I took a right. course in anthropology, psychological anthropology, when I took a college course in that at Princeton, like asked them that, um, that comes down, that's a core question for the professional anthropologist. It deserves to be on an Andreas chart somewhere in terms of anthropology. Here's a question you have to answer. When the tribe that you're studying all drinks the Kool-Aid, quote unquote, whatever that is, they smoke the pipe, there's something going on where you're supposed to take some substance that's supposed to trip you out, somehow make you psychedelic, have an experience. As a professional who's trained for this, do you go with them? Do you take it yourself or do you not? And there's a good argument on all sides of this. And anyway, it's something they discuss in anthropology as you know a, a professional question, what's best practice? Because it could be, you know, my training as an anthropologist is so going to get in the way. It doesn't matter what Kool-Aid I drink. I have no way to know if I'm like going, if I'm learning anything or I'm just looking inside my own mind doing this, this kind of thing, this kind of question. So, you know, I think that's a legitimate topic for a and math is, for wisdom. It, it, it is on thing. the, I mean, it, there could be an, a separate anthropology cheat sheet, but it is on the sociology cheat sheet. It's one of the, you know, it's one of the ways, you know, it's not the only. Hey, it's already thing. there. It's already, it's already there. Did. So yeah. good job. Well, I guess what the the direction I was going with this is the whole like you know ancient Greek thing where they would sit around and debate something sober, and then they debated again intoxicated, and maybe you could have a control group for different intoxicants and figure out like, you know, does this thing we're debating make sense in all of these different you know my, states of mind? I just I don't know. How do you make that legitimate or how do you make that discourse legitimate? So what I think we'll do is uh, this. Uh, um, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, what we're sure. going to do is uh, I think we'll focus. We have our focus question, which is Islam's are all minds the same at the tacit or explicit level? Do minds have the craving? Do all minds have the craving for understanding? And so I think that that question of this uh, psychedelic drugs, other kinds of drugs fits in nicely with that. It can be something that we keep, uh, it can be a little touchstone, you know, like, especially like this craving for understanding. I do not have a craving for understanding like of somebody's uh, psychedelic trip. That's just me. But so maybe in that sense, you know, but I think it's a wonderful thing. Like I do have maybe more of a craving to understand a dolphin's mind, let's say. Uh, so then I have to rethink maybe I should take those psychedelic drugs. We will see. Uh, but we can postpone that decision. <laughs> um, I would like to ask, uh, I think everyone got a chance, so we're making progress. And I want to thank Krister for coming and everyone for coming. But Krister, would you conclude with a prayer for us? Because that's how I like to um, find, um, I guess I, I like to bring in God, basically, to say, look, we are doing things that matter to us we each other matter like maybe to put it in Polynesian worlds we're trying to understand each other we're trying to empathize with each other and the spirit of 
empathy is God, that there's a God who can empathize with us, and we would like to empathize with that God. If we could empathize with that God, we could empathize with everybody. That's, I think, that. And so when we're in this motion, I think just to kind of like, it calms me down to know, oh, we put a period uh, at the end of the sentence, uh, the long sentence we have today. Aslam, what's your... Uh, sorry, I was just going to say, um, uh, Chris sir has a question, how stupid are we humans? Uh, for, <laughs> that's a good one. Should we also make that part of the other question for next week, for next meeting? How, how what? Uh, how stupid are we humans? If you like, I think that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, Kirby says very. Okay. Well, but I think that that uh, why don't we have your question and then this will relate. Is that right? It's a, you know, you can play with it as you want. Like you have your question, right? Is that fine? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I'm very so I'll and be then you can you can relate it to this, you can relate it to the psychedelics. You will you will be reading Paul and you, right? The second uh, chapter, is that right? Uh, I think I was also sorry, uh, I know we're I, I'm taking time, but if Sam Sam, would you like to talk about the psychedelic? Like, because that's his proposition, right? I will talk about the second, the calling of man. Mm -hmm. And then the question, I'll try to relate it to the question that I have in, in ways that make sense. If Sam wants, he can talk about what, you know, he can... Or do you uh, just want to have that part of the natural uh, dialogue that Christer was going to say? I don't know. How, Christer, how would you prefer? Samuel, you we, 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 we stopped. So, yeah, I, maybe I just stopped. Oh, go go ahead, go ahead, Sorry. No, please, Samuel. Are you oh, okay? You want me to go? Okay, I was just gonna say I, I'll just come in unprepared with uh, my own kind of tie it into whatever points are made in the next discussion and kind of just freestyle it that way. I think that's kind of more we'll freestyle it. Okay, psychedelic in nature, anyway. We'll freestyle okay. that, and then we can uh, freestyle the the stupidity of human question, right? That'll that'll all. I think that'll all come in naturally. We'll we'll I'll share that those are on the those are part of the. Unless Christopher wants to. Or do you want to introduce that, Christian? How stupid are we? I think that if we start with one question, the the other things will it will come. I think okay. so. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then my oh, so my question, Christian, would you lead us in a prayer as you like? I can try. Okay, we'll try. So, let us understand that we are the creator and we have enormous potential to understand our universe and to change it. We are all one. And this is a wonderful opportunity to create what we want, a beautiful life for everyone. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I feel relaxed. Thank you, Krista. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I think you should be a Patreon supporter of Math for Wisdom. It's really easy. It takes five minutes and Math for Wisdom is expanding. It, it, it will expand your horizons in many ways. Just go to Patreon and sign up. It's that easy.